People have long dreamed of traveling through the stars and colonizing different worlds. Humanity never changes. Many scientists remain hopeful that future technology will give us practical ways to travel long distances such as the discovery of wormholes or the ability to travel at speeds close to the speed of light. Unfortunately, these practical methods of traversing the universe may be hundreds or perhaps thousands of years away. So, well, what about the impractical solution? That is the idea behind generation ships. A giant spaceship designed to travel long distances at speeds speeds which we're currently capable of. This would obviously take quite a while, with journeys taking hundreds or even thousands of years. As such, a generation ship would need to be able to support human life for a trip taking multiple generations, hence the name. While it's not the ideal case scenario for colonizing the stars, it's certainly the method uh, which we're closest to attaining. If the entire world got together and decided to make pooling their resources to build a generation ship a priority, we're already pretty close to the technology we need. At least in theory we are. There are a number of technological hurdles that need to be overcome, but these are absolutely tiny in comparison to the hurdles of, well, making a wormhole. So, what exactly would a generational spaceship actually look like? What's currently holding us back, and is building one even actually a good idea? The design. Visually, a generation ship wouldn't look anything like you might traditionally think of when you think of a ship. Because of the importance of replicating Earth's gravity, it would look a lot more like Deep Space Nine rather than the Starship Enterprise. The habitable portion of the generation ship would need to be a long, rotating cylinder that generated centripetal force equivalent to Earth's gravity. It would also have to be big, and we'll get to exactly how big a little bit later. But let's just say it would be about twice as large as the tallest buildings that humans have ever built in order to support the entire a colony of people living aboard. Like I say, more fascinating details a little bit later. Now, this does raise an interesting question. Exactly how many people do we need to live on this generation ship? Given the need for genetic diversity, there's not really an easy answer for this. The ideal case scenario puts it at just under 100 people. This assumes that the people are genetically tested beforehand to ensure as heterogeneous population as possible and that nothing particularly bad happens during the ship's extremely long voyage. The most pessimistic estimates put the minimum number well into the thousands based on the assumption that there will be at least one catastrophic loss of population, such as from a disease on board the ship. While those are the extremes, most estimates use a starting population of about 500. This is more than enough to ensure the necessary level of genetic diversity in the face of some unforeseen hardships, and it just kind of assumes that some unstoppable pestilence isn't going to eradicate 90% of the population. So, with our population set of 500 people, we're going to need somewhere for them to live. Now, obviously, they'll be living on the spaceship, but we'll need to allot some amount of space specifically for living quarters. There'll also be, you know, a space needed for everything else. The whole point of a generation ship is that it has a far-off destination and is going to get there eventually. Then there are no pit stops or refueling points along the way, so the ship needs to contain everything it will need for the entire journey. One of the major concerns, of course, is food. Even if we could pack enough food onto a ship to last 500 people for a thousand years, it would all eventually spoil. The ship needs to be capable of producing its own food to keep the crew sustained. A big part of this would be aeroponic farming to grow crops that are a combination of high-yield, nutrient-rich, and calorie-dense foods. The colony can expect to eat an awful lot of beans, potatoes, and tomatoes. There will also be traditional farming to provide meat, fish, and dairy to the passengers. Surprisingly, all of this agriculture wouldn't actually take up as much space as you might think. According to a paper by Dr. Frederick Martin of the University of Strasbourg, the combined aeroponic and conventional farming would require just under half a square kilometer for a population of about 500 people. But there's, of course, more than just food and living quarters. You need control rooms, water, fuel, either spare parts or a facility in which to construct replacement parts, and anything else that you could possibly think of to ensure that the ship makes it to its final destination intact with the crew alive. When we take all of this into account, we can estimate the size of our 500-person generation ship. According to Dr. Martin's paper, the rotating cylinder would need to be a minimum diameter of 448 meters and a length of 640 meters. Now, that doesn't sound too out outrageous, and Martin even mentioned that it would be smaller than the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa, which is 828 meters tall. If we're going strictly by height, then this is technically correct, but our generation ship is going to exist in three dimensions rather than just one. The Burj Khalifa only has a footprint of 4,000 square meters, while our cylinder would have a footprint of nearly 158,000 square meters.
square meters, over three times the size of the Pyramid of Giza. Granted, the cylinder is going to be mostly hollow, but the total floor space of the generation ship would be nearly double that of the Burj Khalifa. At this size, the ship would need to spin at 4.5 RPMs in order to create a centripetal force equivalent to the force of gravity here on Earth. Despite the large size, this should actually be pretty reasonable. It's not like the theoretical Tipler cylinder for backwards time travel that would need to rotate at billions of RPMs, so we're still well within the realm of reality here. And while our generation ship would be massive, it's still perfectly doable. It would be extremely expensive, but we could absolutely build a ship that large if we really wanted to. So what's stopping us? The technical hurdles. Now look, there are obviously a number of problems that need to be addressed with such a long-term space mission. And the first is gravity, which we should be able to handle. Living in microgravity has a lot of detrimental effects on the human body that would make a multi-generational flight impossible. But we can address that by ensuring that the spaceship rotates at a constant rate. That's one hurdle out of the way, so let's just hope they're all as easy as this one. The next issue is water. A generation ship would need to survive for hundreds or even thousands of years, and you know, people be thirsty. Humans absolutely need water to survive, and our ship would have no plans of stopping en route to pick up some more. That means that either the ship needs to be able to create more water, or it needs to be able to recycle the water on board with 100% efficiency. Anything less than 100% and the water will eventually run out. Creating water, likely not an option. It is technically possible to combine hydrogen and oxygen atoms together to create water molecules, but it is dangerous. In fact, it's explosive. Much like scientists turning lead into gold, it is something that we know how to do if we really want to, but it's not a viable solution on a large scale. That means recycling water at 100% efficiency is a must. The good news is that we're not that far off. The ISS recycles water at about 93.5% efficiency, which is a great starting point, but anything less than 100% isn't good enough unless the ship is going to have massive reservoirs of water while also, you know, praying for the best. Similar issues arise with anything that could be considered a consumable, such as oxygen or fuel. With our current technology, and perhaps with any technology, some amount of leakage is going to be inevitable. This creates huge problems, most notably with fuel. You might be wondering why fuel would be a big concern hundreds of years after the generation ship had begun its voyage. After all, in space, it should continue to travel at a constant speed without needing extra thrust, so the fuel doesn't seem terribly important, and for a long time, that's absolutely true. However, once the ship reaches its final destination, it's need to have a way of stopping, or it's just going to crash into the target planet at a massive speed. This, of course, would require fuel, and since rockets use hydrogen as fuel, this is a pretty big problem. Hydrogen atoms are so small that they can pass through things like solid metal, which would make containing the fuel needed to eventually stop and land on a planet rather difficult. And it's going to need a lot of fuel to stop because, well, the ship's going to be quite heavy. It's hard to estimate exactly how much a generation ship would weigh once it was fully stocked, since we don't know all of the technology that's going to be required. For example, radiation shielding is going to be of huge importance as radiation in space is far more deadly than it is here on Earth, where oh, we have our atmosphere to protect us. The easiest solution is to just make the walls thicker in the parts of the ship that are inhabited, but this is going to add some more weight. With all the information available, most estimates put a weight of a 500-person generation ship at around 400,000 tons. By comparison, SpaceX's Starship, the heaviest rocket ever, weighed about 5,000 tons when fully fueled. Building something as large as a generation ship may be possible, but actually getting it off the ground and into space is also going to be a major challenge that we probably aren't yet prepared for. But you know, once the ship's taken flight, everything's going to be fine, right? Well, we can certainly hope so, but it's hard to say. We've gotten so used to the idea of planned obsolescence that it's hard to imagine a vehicle continuing to function properly after hundreds or thousands of years, but that is going to be a requirement. Of course, the nature of cosmic rays necessitates the use of redundant computer systems in space anyway, so hopefully if anything breaks down, there will be time to repair it before too many things break at once. The human problem. So, there are certainly a lot of technological hurdles to overcome with our generation ship, but perhaps the biggest problem of all is people. Not everybody is cut out to be an astronaut, and it takes not only a lot of skill and training, but a lot of courage as well to volunteer to be shot off to the International Space Station. However, the people there all chose to make the trip to space. But what if it wasn't your choice? How many people would be willing to embark on a mission knowing not only that they would die aboard the ship, but their children would die there as well, and their grandchildren? 
and their great-grandchildren and, well, so on, for a very long time. Perhaps they'd believe they were making a sacrifice for the greater good of humanity, but after several generations, that sense of purpose might be lost. The people aboard the ship would no longer have any concept of Earth, nor would they really have any concept of where the ship was headed. All they would know is that they were born for the sole purpose of keeping the ship and the colony alive until it reached some mythical destination that might not even be there. It's a huge ethical dilemma, but let's just hand wave that away for a second by claiming that the new generation generations on board the ship would all be indoctrinated from birth to believe in the mission without question. This still doesn't change the fact that people could be unpredictable assholes. Experiments like Biosphere 2 try to replicate a self-sustaining closed ecosystem. There have been multiple experiments with varying degrees of engineering success, but there is something that seems inevitable. Some people just hate each other. These experiments only lasted a couple of years, but people inevitably broke up into factions and despised one another. They were still able to work together and place the mission above all else, but they weren't trapped there for that long either. All it would take was for a single person to place their anger towards someone else above the mission that they may not even fully understand, and the results could be catastrophic. And that's not to mention that life aboard the generation ship is probably going to be pretty f***ing miserable. There would be no childhood, there would be no retirement. People's entire lives would be spent making sure that the ship remained functional, and they would spend their whole lives confined to a relatively small space. Job options would be limited as well. They would need farmers, engineers, doctors and teachers, but there wouldn't be that much variety among the possible occupations for the people on board. People may not even choose their career path on their own, instead just needing to fulfill whatever role is most needed at the time. There's also another pair of issues that are easy to overlook. One is the development of a new language. Though the generation ship will undoubtedly have a way to communicate with Earth, these interactions would take longer and longer as the ship got further away. There also wouldn't be that much to say to each other, since there hopefully shouldn't be anything important to report before the ship arrived at its destination. With little to no contact, with Earth, it's possible, if not likely, that the people on the ship would develop their own language. We've seen similar things throughout human history before, and it seems reasonable that language on the ship would evolve to a point that it became virtually unrecognizable. On its own, that's not a huge problem until they tried to communicate with Earth again, that is. However, it can exacerbate a problem that would already exist. And then there's the fact that after a thousand years, around 20 to 40 generations, let's say the spaceship finally reaches its destination, it lands on the planet, and they're suddenly met with an entire host of new problems. The skills required for life on a generation ship are very different from the skills required to colonize a planet. There would be no reason for people to have studied this stuff, so they would need to bring with them all of Earth's knowledge in digital form. Fortunately, that's not difficult anymore. Modern computer storage is incredible compared to where we were even 20 years ago, so bringing all of the world's knowledge to another planet should be the most trivial part of all of this. However, that language thing's gonna be an issue, because if it's changed aboard the ship drastically enough, it's possible that no one understands how to read the information that they brought with them. Even if they could, colonizing the new planet is still going to be extremely difficult and require skills that they'd never considered before. Nobody would know how to mine or smelt ore. The experts in aeroponics would have no idea how to grow plants in soil. Countless seemingly basic skills would have to be either rediscovered or learned from the archived information brought from Earth. We can just hope this is adequately planned for and there is some set of instructions on how to build a functioning society rather than just giving them a bunch of encyclopedias and how-to books and just hoping that they figure it out. Otherwise, we run the risk of going to all the trouble of building a generation ship to ensure its safe passage to another planet, only for them to finally land and then waste several decades before finally figuring out how to build a f***ing house.